Hello and welcome to our next topic in MI210, our uh, continuing course on the pop essentials of population PKPD modeling and simulation. Today's topic is a, uh, is a very important one, especially for the further application of models uh, in terms of simulation uh, or inferences based on parameter estimates. And that's the topic of model qualification. So we'll spend some time today talking about uh, model qualification, uh, also sometimes known as model validation, and we'll discuss a little bit uh, what these different names might mean. Um, we'll pose the, the question in terms of a risk-based approach, uh, and then go through various components, including assumption checking, uh, evaluation methods for parameters and predictive performance, and uh, finally, sensitivity analysis. So first of all, um, I just want to point out that uh, there are many names attached to this process, uh, but the thing that they all have in common is this is a process that we use to uh, e evaluate, qualify, explore, check uh, a model uh, before making some sort of uh, application of that model um, to, to guide a decision or to support uh, dosing, etc. And it's been called things like model appropriateness, model checking, model evaluation, model qualification, model validation, and model verification. And there are strict definitions, uh, particularly in, in the um, uh, IEEE sense of, um, of computer software uh, for validation and verification. Um, but we're really not doing that sort of thing in population PK. Uh, PD and really what we're what we're doing is is assessing the model um, for a particular purpose and I, I like the word qualification in that case but you can use the word that you that you think is best I think validation is misleading because uh, validation seems to imply that the model is uh, across the board valid for for whatever purpose and and of course that's not true uh, because as as George Box has has uh, has told us and and many other uh, uh, colleagues in our field have, have repeatedly reminded us that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So really the goal here is, is not to, uh, uh, to demonstrate that the model is completely correct or completely valid, but that the application of a model to a specific purpose can be evaluated or qualified. And we have to keep that in mind then is, is as we're going through this process of model qualification is to think about the intended application of the model, the intended, intended purpose uh, to which we want to apply the model. So one way to view this is similar to um, uh, the FDA's regulatory approach to uh, software validation and, and actually qualification is to use a risk-based approach. Uh, and, and this makes a lot of sense because of course we can never uh, ensure that, that a model is perfectly valid for every purpose, even those that we haven't intended. Uh, but if we use a risk-based approach, um, we can uh, sort of frame the, the problem within a particular context. And this involves three steps. One, I, identifying what are the deficiencies of the model. What are the resulting risks for the modeling and decision-making process? So for example, we might have a model that, that poorly describes the, the maximum concentration, Cmax. So what's the risk for that? Well, the risk is that if we wanted to make decisions based on Cmax is that we're probably gonna be wrong or biased. Okay, well then we might assess that. Will they impact the intended use of the model? Well, if the purpose is to uh, to predict a CMAX related exposure response toxicity, yes, it will make an impact. If the purpose of the model is to generate uh, exposures area under the curve, it may not impact the decision. And so how do we manage that? What are the strategies for managing these risks? And that could involve uh, going back and improving the model, uh, avoiding use of the model for that particular inference, using a different modeling approach, um, but, you know, again, the, the approach here is tied to a particular purpose. Um, again, will the deficiencies or risks impact the intended use of the model? And that's really what we want to, to think about. 
So what should we evaluate or qualify? You could look at the model itself, the structural PKPD model, the models for the covariate parameter relationships or random effects, or we could look at the performance of the model and any inferences from that. So parameter estimates and confidence intervals, hypothesis tests, or predictions and simulations with that model. How might we do that? Well, before implementing a model evaluation method, we've got to think carefully about this, just like when we build a, a, a population PK model, look at the data carefully, review the modeling objective, develop that model according to standard goodness of fit criteria, check assumptions, and define the model evaluation method and criteria for decision making. Those have to be tied hand in hand. What's, what's the decision making or, or intended application of the model? Then you can define what, what the right qualification method should be. Okay, so let's get into a discussion now of the different qualification methods. First, I'll talk about assumption checking. And um, there's one test that can be performed here called the randomization test that I'll describe in more detail under assumption checking, but there's a lot of other assumption checking uh, methods. Some of these we've already discussed in the course so far. There are qualification methods focused on the stability and precision and parameter estimates. Um, there's one called validation through parameter prediction errors. This is a, one of the early model validation publications uh, by Rene Bruneau et al., uh, although that's not commonly used anymore. Um, there's log likelihood profiling, there's bootstrapping, um, cross-validation and leverage analysis, and we'll, we'll discuss each of these. Uh, there's model qualification based on assessment of model performance. So what are the prediction errors, for example, predicting into a new data set? Or um, posterior or, or not posterior, predictive checking. Uh, those are both, fo both focused on the performance of the model for a particular purpose. And then finally, there's, there's something called a sensitivity analysis, which is really part of the apl application of the model. It's part of the simulation effort, but it's worthwhile to discuss it as part of this uh, chapter. <clears throat> Let's move to assumption checking. We can test the assumptions behind the structural model or assumptions in the statistical model even estimation method assumptions. Uh, but really, this is pretty much a model building and data analysis concern. So uh, this is something that should be performed at, as you're developing the model. Uh, we've talked about this a lot. So for example, checking the model, does the model fit the observed data? Right, we know how to evaluate that with goodness of fit diagnostics. Um, has the search reached the global minimum? We can evaluate that too by starting from different initial estimates. Are the parameter estimates consistent with prior knowledge? And we can, we can check that to the extent that we have some prior knowledge, although we might learn something new from this data set. Assumptions about random effects can be checked. Remember, normal distributions centered at zero, etc. And then what's the impact of assumptions in the data recording and assembly? That's something that has to be evaluated potentially through simulation, where if we're not sure that the uh, dosing times were recorded correctly or sampling times, we can explore the impact of, of, of having an error in those and how much that might impact the uh, decisions we're going to make from the model. Around the estimation method, there's more assumption checking to do. Uh, are the assumptions about the likelihood approximation valid? So one way to check that is to try more rigorous methods, compare diagnostics. For example, moving from the FO method to FOCE, FOC interaction, and so on. And are the assumptions about test statistics accurate? Test statistics here, if, if, we're, if we're doing something such as a likelihood ratio test where we're drawing p-values from the modeling process, are those assumptions correct? And one of the methods to do that is something called a randomization test. So this is focused on checking the assumption about the chi-squared distribution of the delta objective function, the delta minus 2 log likelihood, between nested models. And with a randomization test, we can actually determine the true significance level, 
for a given model comparison. That comparison is usually between a full model and, and a reduced model with a with a degrees of freedom of one parameter. We basically generate a, a distribution of this delta objective function for the null hypothesis and you do that by repeatedly um, fitting the model to random permutations of the data set. So you create multiple data sets over and over again uh, under random permutation so there is no association uh, between the predictors and the, and the, um, and the dependent variables uh, and that gives you your null distribution of the delta objective function. So let's look in more detail. How do we do that? You fit the reduced and full models We'll call the reduced uh, the uh, null hypothesis and the full model the alternative hypothesis to the original data sets and data set and, and obtain the, the delta objective function. Then what we need to do is 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 uh, manipulate the data here a bit. We randomly permute or scramble the variable of interest across the entire data set. So if the variable of interest is um, a particular covariate effect. Maybe it's a uh, the effect of a drug interaction, uh, or or a disease state, or something you want to um, determine a a significance level for. It, you you basically dissociate that covariate from the records that it was associated with, and by doing so, you you create a random relationship. So you do that once. You fit the full model again and compare it to the reduced model to obtain the new delta. And you repeat this over and over again, hundreds, maybe thousands of times, depending upon the, the quantities of that distribution that you want to, to observe. Um, so it's quite compute intensive. Uh, but then at the end, you can generate a distribution of the delta objective function and pick a quantile of interest, um, maybe a 95% uh, limit for p less than 0.05. So here's an example of that result. What you see plotted here is the distribution of the delta objective function between the reduced and full model under a series of randomly permuted or randomly scrambled data sets. So this represents the null distribution, the distribution that would happen under random chance. There's no true association between the covariate and the, and the dependent variable now. And so what we see is that the delta objective function and the random chance for this particular case would change would range from about uh, 0.23 units uh, all the way up to oh, 16 units or so but where the the 95th quantile here lands at about 10.29 units so assuming you're just making this sim single comparison this is not an adjustment for, for multiplicity but assuming you're making a single comparison you could say that under the null hypothesis, um, the, the critical uh, value for an alpha of 0.05 is 10.29 units. That means that for a covariate effect to be significant at p less than 0.05, you've got to have a change in the objective function of at least 10.29. And this number is going to change depending upon the model structure, the, the design, and so on. It, it's it's um, uh, quite uh, often the case that the um, chi-squared distribution uh, does not apply here and so this this permutation test allows us to get at that real um, uh, null distribution to generate an actual p-value. So this is a useful method if you really must have a p-value for your analysis. It's quite comp computationally expensive and uh, to do this for every covariate effect would, would be impractical. Uh, also, you'd still have to make adjustments for multiplicity. So this is useful for a pre-specified hypothesis test uh, for which you need a p-value. Okay, what about other types of model checking where we're using data sets to check against? Um, we can use internal techniques, internal data techniques, and those correspond to things like data splitting, where we split the data into a model building and a test data set. Uh, Cross-validation, this is where we make multiple cuts of the uh, original data set. Bootstrap resampling or simulation, 
Uh, bootstrapping allows us to generate multiple replicates of the original data set uh, that are similar but not identical to the original data. And we can apply these in a variety of ways, which we'll talk about. There's also an external data set, which is a separate data set. Uh, and this is the most rigorous test, is if you can predict something um, that is external to the data set that was used to develop the model. So let's talk about one of these methods, the log likelihood profile. And this is a method that's focused on qualification of the parameter estimates. What we're doing here is trying to obtain a marginal slice of the objective function, excuse me, the objective function parameter space uh, to obtain the profile with respect to one particular parameter. Of course, we know this is a multi-dimensional space where the objective function uh, changes across uh, multiple parameters, which are all changing simultaneously. What we're trying to do here is view a single slice of that surface with respect to one estimated parameter. So you start by obtaining final model and parameter estimates. And then what we do is we fix the parameter of interest, let's say it's theta 1, at a range of values above and below the maximum likelihood estimate. Of course, at the maximum likelihood estimate, that's going to lead to the lowest objective function value in this case. What we want to do is perturb theta 1 to values that are not the maximum likelihood estimate. And what we'll do is at each one of those fixed values, we perform an estimation run. And everything is estimated except for theta 1, which is fixed to a new value. We record the minimum objective function value at each value of theta 1. And you end up doing this over and over again. So you can plot a profile of the minimum objective function value versus theta 1. And by doing so, the values of theta 1 that increase the objective function by 3.84 units are defined as a 95% confidence interval. And of course, that relies on the chi-squared assumption. Um, but um, we'll, we'll consider that it's valid for this point. And, if, and the accuracy is, is highly dependent upon the likelihood approximation. Here's an example uh, graphic. Let's look at the first panel first. So here we have plotted the minimum objective function value versus different values of theta. In this case, the theta is the estimated coefficient for the weight effect on clearance in a population PK model. Down here, the, the lowest value associated with this dotted line here uh, is the maximum likelihood estimate of this theta. And what has been done from that point is that at, at fixed points below and above um, that value, the theta has been fixed to different numbers, different values. Okay, so everything from a value of 0 0.003 uh, to 0 0.008, 0 0.006, excuse me. And at these fixed points then the model was estimated and the objective function was recorded. And you see that as you get away from the maximum likelihood estimate, the objective function goes up on both sides. It's not completely symmetric though, which, which um, illustrates the fact that, uh, that sometimes when we make that uh, symmetry assumption, um, it's, not always, it's not always valid. Um, but uh, this is more of an empirical relationship uh, between the objective function and, and, and the parameter of interest. In fact, we call it a marginal relationship or, or marginal uh, distribution here with respect to theta weight. And you see that where you cross this um, dashed line, that's, that's a line that's 3.84 units above the maximum likelihood estimate. And um, that would drop down and give us verticals here, we'll, we'll blow that up, um, that align with our 95% confidence interval from the log likelihood profile. So that's essentially the, the, the task here is, is to, is is to evaluate this surface. Now, if you're going to do this for every parameter in the model, uh, and, and in a tool like non-mem, it's really only practical to do this for fixed effects or diagonal random effects. It's very difficult to do uh, in terms of a block covariance matrix for the random effects. Um, and, and most of the time, we focus on the fixed effects for this purpose. But each one of these steps, each one of these fixed values require, requires a model run. So again, this can become computationally expensive if you have a large number of parameters, 
um, that you want to profile. Okay, another way to get at the same information, qualification of parameter estimates, is by using something called a bootstrap. And this has become probably one of the most popular and most uh, reliable methods of assessing the um, precision of the parameter estimates and, and the stability of the estimates. Um, so you start off by obtaining a final model and a parameter set. And we create several hundreds or thousands of replicate data sets by resampling with replacement from the original data set. And this, this resampling uh, is usually done at the unit of the individual. So we're randomly resampling individuals from a distribution. We perform an estimation run with the final model on each of the replicate data sets. So you're going to have a thousand or so, hundreds or a thousand or so, um, estimation runs to perform here. And then from each of those, we, we capture the final population parameter estimates and create a distribution. And given that distribution, we can look at quantiles of interest. For example, uh, the 95% confidence interval is defined by the 2.5 and 97.5 quantiles of the parameter estimate distributions. So here's a picture of that. This is the frequency distribution of theta one across maybe uh, 500 or 1,000 bootstrap runs. And so across all those runs, you see some distribution here. This represents the, um, the uncertainty or the, the imprecision in, in theta one. Um, and uh, we can sample from that at the 2.5 and 97.5 quantiles, the interval. In this case, our interval spans from 4.16 to 5.85 for whatever this theta value is. Maybe that's a typical clearance in liters per hour. Um, so this approach is a very uh, robust way to obtain these types of confidence intervals. It doesn't rely on the chi-squared assumption that the likelihood profile does. Uh, and um, it also gives us the nice uh, added benefit that it provides the joint uncertainty distribution across all the parameters even including the variance parameters. So we're not left with that problem of, of fixing the um, covariance matrix to zero, which, which we can't do uh, under the likelihood profile. Um, but we can obtain a, um, a distribution like this for all the parameters in the model. There are a few different ways to accomplish this. One is called a non-parametric bootstrap. And that's the one where we're resampling with replacement uh, based on the individual ID. Uh, and so when you, when you resample like this, the data sets, you know, if you have 100 individuals in your starting population, uh, you resample with replacement and generate a new data set with another 100 individuals, uh, but they may not be the same 100 that you started with. There may be some duplication of individuals, there may be some omission of others, uh, but, but there still is the same size data sets, 100, 100 individuals. We stratify resampling across covariates and data types to ensure representative replicates. Uh, this is very important um, because if the corresponding replicate data sets are not representative of the original data set, then your bootstrap analysis is going to be misleading. It's going to be artificially biased. Um, and so a good example of this is, for example, if you're, if you're doing an analysis across a wide range of a covariate maybe um, of an important covariate. So let's say uh, we're doing an analysis that includes data from pediatrics through adults. And if we don't, re if we don't stratify that sampling, we're going to end up with some data sets that might potentially be all pediatric and some that might be all adult. And we're trying to estimate model parameters that, that scale that weight and age effect across the range. It's not going to work. So in those, in those cases, you'd want to stratify it most likely stratified based on age or weight um, in multiple groups so that we can ensure um, that the replica data sets are representative of the original data set. These methods, of course, are conditioned on the data and the resampling method that you're using. Now, there's a parametric bootstrap, uh, and as the name implies, we're, we're resampling based on some parametric form. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're just simulating from the final model. And we simulate random replicates by generating Monte Carlo uh, 
eta's and epsilon's just like we talked about in the simulation lecture the nice thing about this is that the covariate distributions are preserved because they're maintained in the original data set and the replicate data sets just as they appeared originally uh, but the results of this are conditioned on the model so if you have a slightly biased model that you're using to to replicate um, the the bootstrap may not be reflective of the true parameter imprecision and both of these also depend upon using the right likelihood approximation in your estimation method so if you're uh, typically running your estimation model with FOCE interaction, you should be running your bootstrap with FOCE interaction. Uh, if you simplify and go to the FO method, for example, it might improve your runtimes, but uh, you're not um, generating a bootstrap distribution of the same problem. A few other considerations about bootstrapping. One is the number of replicates. How many should you do? Well, I think as a rule of thumb, a thousand replicates is a good starting point. But you can check the stability of the confidence intervals of interest, maybe the 95% interval, um, as the replicates increase. So you're running these and you can pull the results down after 500, 1,000, 1,500, and, and, and see where the confidence intervals stabilize. Some models might, re might require more replicates to, uh, to reach stable confidence intervals. Another consideration is which runs to include in that bootstrap parameter distribution. Should it be runs with a successful minimization and a successful covariance step? Or just runs with successful minimization regardless of covariance step? Or all runs with parameters that report it, including those that terminate the minimization step? And uh, this is really a philosophical question, although for a well um, well-conditioned model, a stable model, there's not much of a difference across these and we've done some internal research on that topic. But uh, philosophically I think that the last solution here is, is that any run that reports parameters should be included because those parameters, even though they may be uh, poorly defined, they're telling you something about that parameter surface. And, um, and so I, I would suggest that you include all runs that report parameters in the bootstrap results. Okay, next topic is a leverage analysis, and this also gets at stability of the parameters. Um, not so commonly used anymore, but uh, you may have seen it in the literature, and so we'll, we'll, we'll review it here. This is one where you obtain the final model and parameter estimates with the entire data set. And then we do some data splitting. We split into M equal sized subsets, equal by individuals. So if you have 100 individuals in the original data set, you might split into 10 data sets of 10 individuals each. You fit the model to data from M minus one subsets. So we'd fit it to nine tenths of the data set. Um, record the population parameter estimates for that one. And then if you include the, the, data set that the data subset that was excluded and exclude a different one, so a different nine tenths, estimate record the parameter estimates, and so on. And you do that 10 times until each one of the subsets has been excluded exactly once. And by doing this, you can explore the stability of the parameter estimates, and it helps you identify highly influential individuals or maybe outliers in the data set. The way you might plot it is something like this. Here's a parameter estimate um, versus the cross-validation subset. The saw the line in the middle is the maximum likelihood estimate, and the dashed lines in indicate the 95% confidence interval. Uh, in this case here, that's obtained from uh, asymptotic normal assumptions using 1.96 times the standard error. Uh, but they could have been obtained through bootstrapping or, or likelihood profiles as well. And what you see at each cross-validation subset indicator is the value of that particular parameter across all of these runs. And, and this model here shows pretty consistent performance. No matter which cross-validation subset, the estimates are hovering right around the maximum likelihood estimate, except this one up here seems to be a, a little bit different, although it's still well within the 95% confidence interval. Uh, 
what we'd be concerned with here is if we if we did a run like this at cross validation, and this point was well outside of the of the confidence interval, that might be indicating that uh, there's inclusion of uh, some individuals here, or or the absence of some important individuals um, to to define that parameter. So they, they're they helping to to identify potentially subsets of that are having excessive leverage on the parameter. Um, Another way to think about this, though, is that all of those individuals are contributing to your estimate, and unless you have good reasons to exclude them, um, you know they're, they're just part of the population distribution. So this this method has been used uh, in the past, but it's no longer commonly used. I don't see a lot of value in in performing this exercise. Okay, next we're going to talk about qualification based on predictive performance. And there's various levels of complexity here. Um, one of the simplest methods is to just predict into a validation set with the final model and parameters from an index set. So the index set is the set from which we built the model. And the, and the validation set or the test set is, is another part of the data, whether you split it once or if you've uh, used a, an external data set, uh, but it's a data set that wasn't used in the model estimation. <clears throat> and then just run a prediction, max eval zero, a simple deterministic simulation with fixed parameters. Remember, we talked about that in the simulation lecture. Uh, by doing so, then we can create diagnostic plots, look at predicted versus DV, residuals and weighted residuals versus time, all of the usual stuff. Uh, and and look at the performance of that model, and we can see, uh, and particularly if we look at, at um, residuals and and predictions versus covariates, we can see if there's anything uh, that could be learned potentially from that new data set. If there are potential areas where the original model does not perform well, uh, maybe in a special population, it wasn't well represented in the original data set, uh, and so that's why it's useful to to cut this plot in in multiple ways. Uh, especially uh, looking at covariates. So that's a very qualitative evaluation. Uh, it's one that can be done visually, uh, but can be quite informative. And it's telling us about the fixed effects performance of the model. Okay, because remember, it's max of L zero. We're not we're not doing anything with the random effects there. We're just making predictions at the final fixed effect estimates. We can also look at validation through predictions uh, by calculating prediction errors. Prediction error is the predicted value minus the observed. Uh, if that's a concentration, if that's a PK model, it's going to be the concentration predicted minus the observed concentration. We can summarize those in terms of a mean prediction error, mean squared prediction error. Uh, we can calculate bias by looking at um, the mean standardized error or a mean absolute error or a root mean squared error. These are all a variety of ways to summarize prediction errors. But there are some statistical issues here. And one of them, the biggest one, is that there's heteroscedastic variance going on in PK models. And so your prediction error here uh, is artificially larger at the, uh, it's artificially larger at the higher concentrations. Um, so you can use a standardized prediction error where you divide by the standard deviation at a particular time point, or maybe use a log prediction error just to assume a log normal distribution of that heteroscedastic variance. Uh, those can be improvements. Uh, but the other problem is that the, we often have more than one observation per individual that leads to correlated predictors, and uh, any statistical tests on that would be invalid. Uh, and even visual representation can be misleading there. There are newer methods proposed for this. Um, and I'd point you to the literature, um, particularly some work recently done by Franz Montre. Um, uh, but again, these are all focused on, on deviations between observed and predicted values. How do you get those? Well, you could do single splitting or external predictions. Uh, remember, we talked about splitting the data once by individual. So use 70% of the data or 70% of the individuals to build a model and 30% to estimate, predict into that validation set, calculate prediction errors, create diagnostic plots. Or we can estimate with one data set and predict into an entirely new data set. 
So cross-validation is one of those methods where we're doing an internal data splitting, very similar to the leverage analysis. So again, we split the data into multiple subsets by individual. Each of the subsets is used to predict into the remaining unused subset. So remember, we estimate from nine tenths of the model and predict into the tenth tenth and create diagnostic plots or calculate prediction errors this way. So here's an example of that. We have predicted and observed values. This is a cross-validation um, diagnostic plot. And it's grouped here by different age groups, age group one, two, and three, just to, to look at the performance across the range of this covariate. Um, here you see the predicted values from the cross-validation. So what's, what's happening here is that um, these are values that are predicted given estimation from uh, the remaining data, the remaining subsets of the data. So remember, we estimate with 9 tenths, predict into the remaining 10th tenth, tenth, repeat that process until we've made predictions for each 10th of the data set. And this one here looks pretty good. The, the performance uh, is, is quite similar across the age range uh, and uh, looks like we have pretty good agreement. Here's another one where the heteroscedastic nature of, where prediction errors were, were calculated, but the heteroscedastic nature of that was, was accommodated by looking at the log prediction error. Now this doesn't uh, adjust for the multiplicity in, within individual or, or the repeated measures within subject, uh, but it still gives us a ballpark uh, estimate. And this was used for model comparison between a base model, a literature model, and then a final model where we're looking at the log prediction error for peak uh, vancomycin concentrations, uh, random concentrations drawn throughout uh, the uh, administration, or trough concentrations, peaks, randoms, and troughs. And so you see in the first case, the base model, well, it's, it has a positively bias at peak, negative bias at the random samples, and a positive bias at troughs, according to the log prediction error. Whereas a literature model does very well at peaks and troughs, slightly uh, underestimates um, the random samples. And then the, the final model here performs pretty similarly to the, to the uh, literature model, maybe a little bit better on the random samples in between. So this was a, um, an example of, of using uh, cross-validation to generate prediction errors. Okay, so enough about prediction errors. Next we'll talk about probably the most commonly used method and, and the most robust, and that's the posterior predictive check. This was originally proposed to check the performance of hierarchical Bayesian models. This is full Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And the question here was, do the simulations based on the model and parameters, so the mean and variance, result in parameter or response distributions that are similar to the observed distribution. So you might think that that's a, that's a guarantee, that if you estimate from a particular data set and the model fits the data well, and you turn around and simulate back that same data set that it's going to match. That's not always the case. And that's because most of our model goodness of fit criteria, in fact, all of them except for this one, uh, and, and all of these model checking techniques that we just discussed are based on uh, the, the predictive performance of the fixed effects model. Um, sometimes we include individual conditional random effects, for example, when we look at IPRED versus DV plots. But every other prediction is based on the population fixed effects. And so the variances are always assumed to take their, um, to take their expected value of zero. Well, it's not until you actually simulate from those estimated variance distributions that you can per assess the performance of those. And so that's where the predictive check methods are very useful in that they're really the only method that, that does a, a, um, a thorough evaluation of the performance of the model under both the fixed effects and the random effect variance distributions. So here's how you do it. We obtain a final model and parameter estimates. 
and simulate several replicate data sets of the original data set using the final model fixed and random effect parameters. And when we're doing a full posterior predictive check, we need to obtain posterior distributions. And we can do that through parametric bootstraps, which I'm going to describe here, or it could also be Bayesian posteriors or non-parametric bootstraps. But what we're talking about here is including the uncertainty or the imprecision in the parameters as part of the simulation. So we simulate several new replicates with each of the original replicates from step three. And now for each of the simulations in step four, we calculate a characteristic of the data that's of interest. So for example, a Cmax in each individual. And then we might summarize Cmax. Well, what's the median Cmax in this population? What's the first quartile? What's the uh, minimum Cmax? Uh, any, any of these ways of summarizing the data are, are, are fair. Uh, you should focus on summarizing the data based on quantities that are of interest to your decision-making purposes. And then we calculate the same summary statistic from the original data set and then compare the observed and the simulated. Now, of course, for the simulated values, we're going to have a full distribution because we're running multiple replicates. The observed value is just going to be the same value. And we can calculate something called the posterior predictive check p-value, which is just a fraction of the simulated data points that are greater than the observed value. So it is a measure of how extreme the simulated values are compared to the observed. Here's a typical result. What we have here is a frequency distribution of the simulated median Cmax. So this is the median Cmax in the entire study population. The dark vertical line here represents the observed median Cmax in the original data set. The distribution represents the distribution of simulated median Cmaxes across each of the replicate data sets. Each one of those is a reflection of the observed data set. And so we're calculating the same statistic for the observed data set, but we're doing it for each of the simulation replicates. And so what we'd like to see is that this observed value lands somewhere in the middle of our simulated distribution. Now, this one we discussed here was, was based on a posterior predictive distribution. Remember, posterior indicating the Bayesian notion that we're, that we're simulating from parameter uncertainty distributions, not just the final point estimate of the parameter. By doing so, using a maximum likelihood tool such as NonNum, it's quite computationally intensive. A little more efficient if we're doing something like MCMC uh, estimation in a full Bayesian method like WinBugs. Um, what, we, what we've come to do is to simplify this, and, and we've, our discipline now calls this a predictive check where we ignore the uncertainty in the parameters. We assume the uncertainty in the parameters is small relative to other sources of variability, and you perform one set of simulations from the final model. Calculate the statistic of interest and compare with the observed data. So it's the same process except we're now doing this from the point estimates of the thetas, omegas, and sigmas rather than the full uh, joint uncertainty distribution across of those. So here's a predictive check. Uh, again, back to that vancomycin data set. We see two plots here. We see uh, competing models in the top panel and the bottom panel. And we're looking at three quantities of interest. We're looking at um, the first quartile, I'm sorry, first quantile, um, excuse me, first quartile or the 25th uh, percentile, the median or the 50th percentile, and the third uh, quartile, which is the 75th uh, percentile. Okay, so we're looking at different points in the distribution of uh, vancomycin serum concentrations. And for each of these values, we've summarized the observed values, which are, the, are these vertical lines. These three vertical lines here indicate the observed first quartile, median, and third quartile. And then the model shows you the simulated values um, that, through this distribution and density overlay. So a couple things we can see from this plot. Number one is that neither one of these models is doing very well across the range. 
The model in the top panel does pretty well for the median and not so bad for the third quartile, uh, but completely misses the first quartile, where this is the vertical and uh, this is the simulated distribution. The model in the bottom panel does even worse uh, by completely missing the first quartile. Maybe not so bad. No, it actually misses most of the median as well and most of the third quartile, uh, under predicting in all cases. So as a model comparison tool, this, this highlights that the top panel indicates a better model, uh, although there is still room for improvement there. Here's something that we has come to be known as a visual predictive check, um, where we're looking at simulations now um, described by the lines on this plot and observed data by the, uh, the symbols, the plus signs. Um, the simulations indicate the, a median, the solid line, and a, um, in this case, I think it's a 95% population prediction interval um, at each one of these time points. And essentially, this is just simulating over and over again and calculating the 95% uh, quantiles of that distribution and then overlaying that on the observed data. What you'd like to see is that, you know, most of the data lie within this relationship. Uh, you might have a few points on the outside. Um, and um, this is the so-called visual predictive check. There are different variations on this theme, um, but uh, that's the basic idea. Now, one of the problems with the visual predictive check is that there's not a very um, rigorous assessment of the distribution you know, you're looking here at a median and the, and the envelope, essentially. Uh, but what if the distributions don't match? Um, so that can be evaluated in a couple of different ways. We can look, for example, at the predictive check, similar to the, to the Bayesian posterior predictive check here, where we look at different parts of the distribution. So we take the C average in, and we'll take the mean C average in the population, the third quartile and the first quartile. So now we're looking at different components of the distribution. And you could break this up even further. You could take, uh, you know, the, the 10th percentile, uh, the 90th, uh, whatever you want to look at here. But th this indicates um, a pretty good predictive check result where the, the observed data here uh, is the solid black vertical line. The predictive check p-value is indicated. So 0.5 would indicate that about 50% of the data are, below, are above the observed and 50% are below. 0.22 represents about 22% above and uh, corresponding 78% below, and so on. So um, usually if this predictive check p-value is, is uh, uh, somewhere between uh, 0.05 and, and 0.95, we're, 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 we're pretty happy, uh, although you'd like to see something closer to the center of the distribution. Um, another way to compare the distribution, and probably the most rigorous way, is to look at every point in that distribution. So here we have a uh, simulated C average in each individual. And we're taking this population of individual C averages. Um, so it's one point per person. And we, we calculate the quantiles of that. So basically a rank order of that relationship. And we compare that to the observed quantiles of C average in each individual. Um, this is called a quantile-quantile plot, or QQ plot, where we're now comparing the entire distribution. So we're not just looking at the envelope and the median, or even just the quartiles. We're looking at the entire distribution. This is a, a very rigorous test of the population variability and, and the distribution assumptions involved. And what you'd like to see is something like this plot, where you, you repeat this for every replicate. Maybe we have 1,000 replicates here. The solid black line indicates a perfect agreement, and uh, the, the light blue lines indicate the, the simulated values. And, and see, they're nicely centered around uh, the, the, um, the population perfect agreement. Uh, this indicates that this model describes the distribution of C average in the population uh, quite similarly to the observed distribution. If you had this sort of result, you could safely say, I'm going to use this model to simulate C average and, and potentially other related characteristics like AUC or some central tendency of the data.
this this model is is you could say would be qualified for that purpose. Doesn't mean that it can adequately simulate Cmax. We haven't tested Cmax here, um, and so you might want to do a similar test for Cmax if you needed to predict Cmax. And then just a couple words here. When is valid? The validation, evaluation, qualification, whatever we want to call it, when is it less important? Well, when you're just developing a model for descriptive purposes, you don't intend to, to really do much with the model. Model-derived inferences are insignificant. Um, so really, you know, if, 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 you're, if you haven't used modeling at all and you're at the end of phase three and you're just describing uh, data for, for POP-PK labeling, um, yeah, the qualification step is not quite as, as important, although you'd want to understand the precision of the parameter estimates at least. Um, it's really more important when, when you're making decisions based on, on the model and or inferences based on the model. Now one case where it's not as important is when you're applying it to a purpose that you can't easily validate or, or qualify, and that's an extrapolation. So you're taking the model and applying it to conditions that are different than those that were used to develop the model. You're, you're predicting outside of the range of the original data. It's almost impossible to qualify that because you don't have those data to, to compare against. So in that case, we'll, we'll come up with a different solution. And of course, uh, if the process is just, uh, just to check a box or satisfy a requirement, uh, that's, that's really not very, uh, very good incentive for, for going through this effort. Okay, a few words on sensitivity analysis because it's related to model qualification. And this is particularly important when the model is applied to a purpose that's not easily evaluated. Extrapolation. In, under those conditions, we wanted to determine how the model inadequacies affect the conclusions drawn from the modeling application. So we know that the model might be wrong, but how might the incorrectness or the, the degree to which the model is wrong impact the decision you're going to make. And this is really critical when you're using models and simulation to support drug development decisions. Designing a new trial, selecting the dose for the next study or dose range, um, that sort of thing. So the two types of sensitivity analysis, one is local and one is global. The local sensitivity analysis is also known as a fixed point sensitivity analysis or fixed point perturbations. Global sensitivity analyses are, are actually based on the uncertainty distributions across all the parameters simultaneously. Let's talk about the local first. We can perform a local sens sensitivity analysis by evaluating the gradients with respect to each parameter. So the sensitivity is basically the, the change in a response as a function of the change in the parameter. That's one way to look at it. Or you could simulate with fixed point perturbations of the parameter and then derive to whatever, whatever your quantity of interest is, is uh, and, and do that across a range of different values. So this table represents that sort of an example. We have different fixed values of this parameter here um, from 0.25 to 1. And for each one of these, we perform simulations of a clinical trial. On the right side, we, we identified the percent of trials that were successful. Uh, successful trials here uh, are defined as trials that uh, differentiated from placebo. Uh, and so you see the sensitivity now of, uh, of this outcome here, the percent of trials ranges from 30% to 70, all the way up to 99%, depending upon what value we use for this parameter. So this is a highly influential parameter. When we range from 0.25 to 1, we change the outcomes quite dramatically. So this would tell us here that if we're wrong about this parameter, we could be quite wrong about the, the predicted uh, success rate for this trial design. There are some limitations in the local sensitivity analysis. One of them is that it only reflects the sensitivity to the uncertainty in one parameter at a time. And it's inefficient because you have to repeat this exercise for every parameter of interest. So if you had four or five parameters that you would like to explore the sensitivity to, you have to repeat this fixed point sensitivity analysis, each one of these at, at multiple fixed points. 
And of course, the conclusions now are only accurate if the fixed values of all the other parameters are correct. So those are some limitations. A potential solution to that is a global sensitivity analysis. So now you're looking across the potential error or uncertainty in the parameters on all the parameters simultaneously. You need to do that by starting with quantifying that distribution. And we can do that uh, like we described through bootstrapping, through um, simulation uh, from uh, the variance covariance matrix of the estimates that we get in the dollar cove step in non-mem, or from a full Bayesian estimation where we get the posterior distribution. We use Monte Carlo simulation methods to simulate from the uncertainty distributions. Again, very similar to a true posterior predictive check, except now we're doing a posterior predictive simulation of a new scenario. And then we incorporate that uncertainty at the inter-trial variability level. Um, sensitivity outcomes can be viewed then over a continuous range, and we can characterize this sensitivity to uncertainty in all the model parameters simultaneously. It's not just sensitivity to fixed points. Here's a plot, the probability of a successful trial, same example, but now we're looking at that same parameter and another one here, the, the, this is the hazard of the placebo effect. Um, I'm sorry, the hazard for the placebo group to drop out and this is the, uh, um, the drug effect parameter. And you can generate this, this joint distribution now because we're looking simultaneously at the uh, imprecision or uncertainty in both parameters. In this model, you see that as long as this, this parameter reaches a value of about 1.5 or 1.25, and if the, if the placebo dropout hazard is about 0 0.015 or so, we're gonna be on this, on this high probability surface. At lower values though, the probability of success is, uh, is much lower. So there's lots of examples of global sensitivity analyses in PKPD. One of them is in the physiologically based pharmacokinetic literature uh, where they're looking at simulation from a range of parameter values. Other methods that used fuzzy numbers uh, for the same sort of approach. And these PPPK examples were really the first ones to explore this, but they lumped the uncertainty and the variability together into one term. What we're talking about here with global sensitivity analysis for trial simulations is to incorporate all the parameter uncertainty uh, and the inter-individual variability, maintaining the right hierarchical model. So here's another um, way we can view that analysis. Uh, I showed you the, the, the uh, three-dimensional plot before. Now we can look at the marginal slice of the probability of success as a function of uh, uncertainty in a parameter. So, here we see plotted the probability of success versus the um, uncertainty distribution for baseline clearance, IC50, placebo group hazard, and drug effect parameter. And we can see pretty quickly that some of these parameters, no matter what value we used, don't impact the probability of success. What, what this is is plotted here, the success is a zero or one for each trial, and we're doing a local logistic regression smooth through each one of these. You see here that um, the probability of success is, is not changing across the, the different values of clearance or IC50 that were used. But the probability of success is, is highly sensitive to this hazard for the placebo group as well as the drug effect parameter. And it increases uh, quite dramatically here until reaching a maximum at this point. So the way we might interpret this is, is to say, if we're, this is an extrapolation of our current model. If we're wrong about this uh, simulation parameter for the placebo group hazard or the drug effect, we could be quite wrong about the success of the trial. However, if we're, if we're wrong about clearance or IC50, it's not gonna matter too much. And that, that's because in this case here, the doses being used were very high, right, right around maximum tolerated dose. And so uh, basically uh, clearance and IC50, which are, which are uh, more, more in tune with, with the dynamic range of exposure, are not so important. Uh, it's really the maximum drug effect that matters, Emax. Here's another example where we can look at predictive checks. Here, here we see uh, predictive checks 
on multiple endpoints. In this case, uh, is a PKPD model. We're looking at the concentration of drug at two weeks, the response, the pharmacodynamic response at two weeks, and the change from baseline in response at a particular endpoint. And we're doing that for each of different dosing cohorts. So you can, you can divide this, cut it in many ways, and look at multiple endpoints. Uh, you know, there's not just one plot that's going to give you confidence in the application of that model for multiple purposes. You really should focus on each of the indi individual purposes of that model. And then here's a representation of the global sensitivity analysis. First, we're showing a, 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 a predictive check here. Uh, this is a true posterior predictive check. We're including the uncertainty and parameters. So you have the population variability in this response defined by the red lines, the population median value by the blue lines, but then the dotted and dashed lines around these solid lines indicate the uncertainty in those bounds. So the, the, um, uh, the confidence you might have in, in the upper confidence interval, the confidence in the mean, and the confidence in the lower population prediction interval. We can look at that same example again in the sensitivity. Uh, this one uh, shows you know, multiple parameters here. We're clearly the, the top left and maybe the bottom left are those that seem to have the most impact on the outcome, but these other two parameters show relative lack of sensitivity. And so that, that's, that's the kind of thing that we need to explore when we're, when we're checking a model for its use in an extrapolation or some case that we can't compare to the original data. So the take-home message of this, of this uh, topic is what are the underlying assumptions in, uh, and inadequacies of a particular model? And will those assumptions and inadequacies have a significant impact on the inferences drawn? And that's, that's the case if we're doing uh, any of the model qualification methods or the sensitivity analysis. So for practice problems, uh, I, I will put together some examples of, uh, of a couple of these methods and post them to the site with some instructions on how to execute those. Uh, they'll run on the SIMI server and uh, you'll get to, uh, to try those out uh, and explore some of these methods. Uh, please also post questions to the course site as needed and, um, and I'll respond to those. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I am traveling and on the road for the next week here but we'll be able to respond via email to your requests. Thanks for your attention and um, please, uh, please stay in touch and let me know if there are questions on this topic. Thank you.